So my name is Sandra Furman and I'm the director of the CU Art Museum and Janelle is our inaugural artist in residence and the residency is really premised on um, artists that have an inquiry based practice and would really um, utilize the resources that a uni research university can have to offer. So um, the artist comes for the full semester, makes a few site visits beforehand and sort of determines what departments and faculty and students um, he or she would like to work with. Uh, yeah, That's nice. and creating artwork um, with faculty and students in the gallery over the course of the semester. So Janelle's project has really had three phases, a dance party for our reopening, um, and then she worked with uh, the dance department and the ceramic department um, on a performance night, and then she's going into our final phase, which is her installation. <laughs> Is that a accurate? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Is she, she inquiry-based? Yeah, she's inquiry-based. Are you inquiry-based? <laughs> I'd say I'd subscribe to that. I don't know. You're inquiring. I'm inquiring. <laughs> so nice to be here, everybody. It's such a always such a pleasure to share my work with people and get to know people in the community. Yes, I've been here since about uh, beginning of January. From where? Um, come from New York City. I was born and raised in Queens, New York. Mm. Um, what part of Queens? Uh, near Jamaica, so sort of near the airport. Um, yeah, my mom was born in Norway. My dad was born in the Dominican Republic, and they met in an Irish pub mm -hmm. in Queens. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I did my undergraduate work at Emory University and studied cultural anthropology. And then I actually sort of fell into art making. I was my work study job was in the ceramics program, mixing clay, glazes and, um, and clay, and loading kilns and doing that kind of studio tech work. Um, and they call ceramics the gateway craft for a reason and I got hooked and it seemed like it was another um, kind of way for me to explore cultural <laughs> production um, and have that kind of a research area but also become a cultural producer um, and really use my hands and use um, use my body use other ways of knowing I would say to also research um, extend my research um, and I did my MFA in 2006 at Virginia Commonwealth University. It's in Richmond, Virginia. So I spent a lot of time on the East Coast, so it feels really good to have a sort of chapter west. I had that beautiful drive out here. I got to have that moment going across Kansas where you then see the <laughs> majesty of the mountains, um, which was really lovely. And I'm kind of headed to California after this. So this is a really lovely kind of gateway to the west, um, this opportunity. So um, I had done a, um, a project, and I'll show some slides of that, um, with Sandra a few years ago um, at a university in upstate New York at SUNY Buffalo, uh, where they had invited me to come um, create a project on site and use the gallery really as like a project space um, where students and faculty and community members could come in and see a piece develop over time. Um, and we had a really great experience, and we, when we were kind of talking about how that all went, um, we both agreed that the one thing we would have maybe changed is to have it be a semester long. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so uh, that looks amazing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, it's been really amazing to have that opportunity to um, to work with Sandra again, to come out to see you, Boulder, um, and to have the whole semester to really deeply engage with students and the community and the university at large on a project. Um, so I'm going to show you guys a bunch of um, past work. I work um, in a number of different ways. I actually have a simultaneous and parallel collaborative pro practice in addition to my work as an individual sculptor. Um, my sis, I've, so I'll just, maybe I'll get started on that. This is an image um, from my website. And my website is Las Hermanas Iglesias because that's our collaborative team name. So this is me over here, and this is Lisa and her son Bowie um, over there. And I'm the youngest of four daughters. Um, so naturally, you know, like growing up, I very much, like my identity is very sort of formed around this idea of being a sister. Um, and when we were trying to come up with a collaborative name, the sisters made a lot of sense for us. We were always referred to as the sisters or the girls. And that kind of sense of sisterhood and collaboration is already built in to that, to that name. Um, so... That's definitely a, um, a huge part of, of my practice as well, is this idea of collaboration. Um, for the museum opening, 
I was going to be arriving and the museum was reopening after being closed for... We were closed for 10 months. Yeah. Um, because we had some humidity ventilation issues, mm. so... Yeah. Yeah. So it was the opening of a bunch of new exhibitions and sort of the reopening of a museum. Um, and I was just arriving. And so since usually when you go to an opening, the room is full because there's an exhibition being mounted. Whereas in this case, I was just getting there and starting a project. And so we thought that maybe we could use that empty gallery as sort of um, a dance space, as a place for celebration. It was also the same week as like Chinese New Year and Mardi Gras and Valentine's Day. So there was a lot of reasons to celebrate. Um, so I re-launched um, a project I had done a few years ago. It's called Everybody Likes to Dance. And um, in this project, we asked my mom. back to that. We asked my mom to choose a merengue, um, a pulse that she grew up dancing to in Norway. And we asked my father to choose a merengue that he grew up dancing to in the Dominican Republic. That were kind of traditional dances really of their era that they would have heard at parties or would have learned how to dance to. Um, and then we worked with five different musicians and they made mashups of those songs. So they weren't given any rules. They were told you can add beats to these things, you can slow them down, you can speed them up. Um, whatever way makes sense for you and how you interpret these two songs, you can put them together. So what you just heard was a little mashup of that. So as part of that project, we put out a CD with these kind of mashups of these two tracks. Some of them are super danceable. Some of them they actually added almost like a, um, a drum beat or a dance beat onto. And other ones are quite dissonant um, and hard to dance to. And then one of those reasons was we didn't really want to privilege a sort of romanticization of that fusion, but we really wanted to kind of talk about all the different possibilities that happen. So alongside this project, um, we also learned the dance steps for both dances and created a uh, mashup choreography for both of them. And then we hand painted a dance floor that has this kind of dance diagram of the choreography on it. So you can see the, um, the one, two, three, four in the left and right, and the audience can then um, take part in this. And along with the project, there's also a poster of the dance steps. And so in many times, um, oftentimes our projects, they, um, that's a poster image. And then many times our projects also have these kind of multi-layers of different references going on. So this is also hearkening back to um, a 1960s Andy Warhol print. He did a series where he took dances like the Foxtrot and the Cha-Cha-Cha, and he made these screen prints of the dance diagrams on them. And they were one of the first times that um, works were being um, displayed on the floor, but were also kind of considered paintings or prints. Um, so in our case, we're making um, these hand-painted paintings, but they're also functional dance floors as well. Um, so this was in the museum. Um, we, had a, we had vinyls on the dance floor. We also had like mahjong set up for Chinese New Year. We had a pinata in the shape of a disco ball um, that we also broke at the end of the evening after a dance party in the museum. And just to try to like activate the space, um, oftentimes a lot of people, um, museums are amazing repositories for objects, but they can also feel very tomb-like, you know, and I think a lot of people have a certain um, assumption of what they're supposed to encounter and how they're supposed to behave in a museum. And so part of my um, role that I see as a museum is almost like a creative troublemaker and a problematizer. Um, so I'm trying to take that quite seriously and um, sort of spark new things that may not have happened at the museum before. So it was great to sort of have host the first dance party in the museum. Hopefully there'll be other ones to come as well. Um, I'm also teaching a class at CU. I'm doing a couple of things. I'm teaching a sculpture class um, and I'm also working with a number of different classes across the campus. So with the sculpture class I'm trying to um, take the projects that I'm working with in the museum and involve the students. So for this project, right when we got to school, I invited the students to look at the collection and also think about famous works of art um, and create a pinata based on a famous work of art. So here you'll see some of the students' work. This is a Mondrian. Um, this is that famous Venus statue. Um, this is the Duchamp urinal. Um, and that also comes out of a bunch of different projects that I've done involving making pinatas into, into sculptural objects that are um, presented in gallery spaces. So this is a project I did with my sister where we um, created pinatas of ourselves and then we proceeded to beat each other. <laughs> so this project is called Sibling Rivalry. It also, a lot of our collaborative work comments on our kind of familial relationships, um, not only on the sort of background and our cultural fusions, but also on our relationship in terms of family. And so um, these are just like the Andy Warhol reference in terms of picking up and, and taking off from different people in our history. Um, the, the pinatas are filled with red candy and red glitter, and the audience is in, invited to take the candy with them as they encounter these kind of corpses in the space uh, as a reference to Felix Gonzalez Torres. 
Um, so we've done a lot of different work together, Lisa and I. I'm going to kind of skip forward to my work a little bit. Um, but uh, uh, Brick TV, which is this um, Brooklyn media um, amazing organization, just put out um, sort of an amazing series of uh, different makers and creatives in Brooklyn. And so my sister and I are featured in episode six. So if you guys look this up, mm -hmm. it talks a lot more about our pinata projects. We recently piloted a social practice program in the Lower East Side with the Senior Citizen Center, um, where we created um, a number of different uh, uh, pinatas with the senior citizens. So there's a little bit. I've been working on this summer um, is a collaboration with um, the Good Companion Senior Center, <coughs> which is under Henry Street Settlement, and which is also under that umbrella is Abrams Art Center. Yeah, and they're a really amazing organization on the Lower East Side. Um, they're one of the oldest social work organizations in the United States. They do all kinds of things from healthcare and job training. And so, yeah. how do you have a sort of this is going to look a little technical difficulties, but you can see some of the pinatas that we're making. And these are all decided by the participants. Um, and it also came off of um, going to the senior center and talking to people about what they really enjoyed about the senior center. And it was a really a, a place where they would get together to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate holidays, and a space for community. And so um, each of the pinatas that we made were also then donated for the future birthday parties. They have a birthday party every two months for everybody that's involved um, at the senior center. Um, so part of it was that we, you know, we bashed them at the this big community potluck and celebration and art exhibition and then the ones that weren't bashed were also left for the for the rest of the year to be um, included in their celebrations and there were a lot of amazing characters and friends that we met um, through that project um, this is a, a piece where Lisa and I were in Paris for six months on a residency we were invited um, to go to sort of an international center had a studio for each country we met a bunch, a bunch of amazing other artists from around the world um, it was great except it was it was you know it was meant for one artist and we were two and so we were sharing the stipend for one and sharing the living accommodations for one which was really challenging and we were butting heads a lot this is where we decided to make pinatas of each other and beat each other up um, and so we would also go for walks all the time because you know, even if you're in Paris and don't have any money you can get like a cheap bottle of wine and a chocolate croissant and just walk around the city all day and be as happy as can be there's so much to soak up um, we were there in the winter time and we just noticed that there were a lot of lost gloves all on the city on these walks we would take all over the city so we started collecting the lost gloves and bringing them back to our studio um, and we would make uh, the missing pair and so what you're looking at is um, one of the gloves that's real and then another glove that's a painting on a piece of paper that's cut out and so we're sort of reuniting the pairs that are together. And in this way, we're also kind of bridging our, our practices. Lisa's more invested in drawing and painting. I'm really invested in sculpture and working with objects that I find, objects that kind of create um, you know, a different kind of portrait of a place. And so in, in a sense, this is a portrait of our time in Paris. Um, it's probably you know, like a walk every day. And sometimes we found a glove, and sometimes we didn't. And this is how much we found over a six-month span. Um, this is a uh, Père Lachaise where Oscar Wilde is buried and there's so many amazing, it's such an amazing um, cemetery. We would often take walks there and this was one of our favorite places to visit. Um, we also noticed that um, when we were walking around in terms of finding things on the street that they were using blankets to sort of sieve out the debris from going into the gutter. And so this is a piece where we took one of those gutter blankets, we hand laundered it several times um, and then it's embroidered with an Oscar Wilde quote. We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking up at the stars. And so really thinking about inverting the value of something that's completely low and a, a throwaway and meant to be like one of the most maybe disgusting things, and then sort of elevating it into like a tapestry-like status. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. This is a project we did. We met some artists, um, artists in Tasmania, and they invited us to come and do a residency there. We wanted to see well, we only bring suitcases with us. What kind of work can we make while we're there that will indulge us in getting to um, also, you know, be a little bit of a tourist as well and, and, and see all the sights that we want to see. Um, so we made these cardboard cameras and there's a cardboard Polaroid. And we would take photos in this kind of um, performative way and then we would have to draw what we would see through the viewfinder. <laughs> so instead of this process where you're like looking through the, your phone or you're taking you know, pictures very quickly, all of a sudden we were taking pictures very slowly where if you decided to take a picture of something you had to really sit down and draw it and get to know it um, so these are some examples this was the organization that we were working at it was a sort of grassroots artist run initiative called 6a and there's the drawing of it um, this is the friend's home we were staying at and the drawing of that 
Um, this you can see also the sort of performativity of this, of taking these photos next to people who were taking photos, um, which also became this kind of interesting discussion with people about taking photos and how it adds to or takes away from your experience um, and while you're traveling and experiencing a place. Um, oftentimes we also extend our collaborations to other people. This is a, a series called Nude Suits. Our mother grew up knitting um, since the time she could hold a knitting needle, so we asked her to knit us these nude suits so they cover us, you know, from toes to neckline. They have a zipper up the back. Um, they have our tan mm -hmm. lines. You know, she included, they have hair, they have nipples, they have everything except for um, uh, things like scars and um, tattoos and things like that we embroidered. So anything that was sort of self-inflicted, we embroidered on ourselves. Um, and we took a series of photographs with these. This is Lisa's son, Bowie, um, and for his first birthday, our mom actually knitted him a birthday suit, and she knit him um, a nude suit as well for his first birthday. So this was one of our later shoots um, that we did with Bowie. And we were really just thinking about this idea of, just like the pinatas, where all of a sudden there's almost like a figurative sculpture you know, if when we put these suits on, we really become figurative sculptors. And thinking about the, the nude and women in art history, you know, there's a really famous line of like, why are all the women in the Met, you know, why are all, why are all the women nude? Why are all the, why are, why aren't there the women artists, but why are all, why is the nude such a, um, you know, that's how the women get in the Met. So, um, so there's a commentary on that, it's very tongue in cheek, and it's also just um, a really funny conversation just about sort of, um, the sexuality of our bodies really become comic and flattened out rather than sort of hypened, like that sexuality, instead of being hypersexual, we become kind of less sexual by it. Um, and so just, yeah, just really thinking about, about that um, as well. And, oh no, I just go, okay. So um, this is our mom figuring out how to, how to do different <laughs> stitches. Um, we've recently started um, a new project with her where Lisa and I have been doing a bunch of drawings and paintings that we send back and forth in the mail for quite some time. And it's a really lovely visual conversation of mark making between us. Um, and so with these we have our mom take a look at all of them and she curates a few from the series and then she transfers them into a knit surface. So we're probably even calling these knit paintings and they're shown alongside um, the other paintings. And they're some of my favorite works that we've been doing with her lately. Um, they're really beautiful. So, you know, they're just these kind of abstract marks in paper. Sometimes they're watercolors and there's not. And then she translates and decides whether they're a pearl net or a back and forth, what the size is. Um, and so while she claims she's not an artist, she makes so many different decisions about how to translate from one medium into the other. Um, and just also just in this terms of this idea of translation, you know, English was her fourth language. So, um, you know, we grew up not speaking Norwegian. And so there's just that, that sort of space between us and that idea of translation. Um, we also find extra like layered in terms of our relationship to her, this idea of women and craft and like what's, what she's comfortable with talking about as her, is her artwork, um, which whereas um, something like creating a painting she would never she would never be into, but creating a knit painting, um, she would, you know, she's really enthusiastic about that kind of a challenge. So this is another one. Um, there's a close-up as well. So Lisa and I also um, engage in a, in a series of competitions. Sometimes these are really formally staged. They're even um, held in public with, with audiences. Sometimes they're much more um, intimate. This is just a series we did on our iPhones. So it's Lisa and when she was eight months pregnant, I was trying to carry around a watermelon all day just to see how maybe she felt with all that weight. Um, and I really quickly gave up on that. But then I tried to see if I could like kind of compete and commiserate with her belly in other ways. So this is holding objects in comparison, um, in comparison to her stomach as well. Um, and recently we got the chance to do these live, which was really fantastic. My mom um, very graciously agreed to be sort of the referee. So this was um, a competition round one, there's no bad weather, there's only bad clothing. It's a Norwegian expression that she always told us growing up. And this is as much sort of clothing as we can fit on us, and then who can get um, undressed first was the was that. And, and this whole series, sometimes we're doing things that sort of relate to like beauty pageants. Sometimes it's kind of um, almost like a game show or like a reality show. This is how many cherries I could fit in my mouth until I become completely disgusting and distorted. Um, we'd have to you know, do all these different sort of like rites of passage. They, they relate to um, everything from beauty pageants to um, sports shows and um, different kinds of competitions, game shows, that kind of thing. 
So I'm going to move on just to sort of my individual practice. Um, I've always been really grounded on, on um, taking inspiration with objects from the natural world, like so many different artists, whether it's landscapes or seashells. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in the architecture of animals and insects, so nests and um, things that animals build um, has always been super inspiring to me. Um, so these are some really early ceramics work that I was doing um, where I would display them alongside things that were from the natural world, world and there would be sort of this blurring of um, things that were man-made. You can see there's like a little, um, uh, like a, there's a little piece of plastic off the side that's hard to see. But there's things that look like they could be the natural world, but they're actually from like a supermarket. There's things that I made that are sort of this in-between, um, you know, almost could be, but, but, but are handmade. And then things um, that are cast from the natural world. So they're, you know, the forms are directly lifted. Um, and, then, and then the straight up objects, such as the, um, the little wasp nests over here. Um, this is all masking tape. These are some early pieces where they're just sort of crawling out of the gallery. And those pieces would, um, almost like kudzu, this when I was living in the south, I became really interested in the ways that you would go down a street and then you go down a street three months later and the entire side of the highway would be covered. And so this piece kind of would start in one place and then over the course of the exhibition would start kind of engulfing even other works in the show, which is kind of eat everything around it until it was cut off at the end of the show. Um, I like this idea of a sort of circularity with my work. I've been really trying to figure out how to align my philosophies and my practices. And so being somebody who's really sensitive to all the stuff around us, right? We were talking about, I heard somebody mentioning the story of stuff, which is something I've used as a teaching tool. I really love it. But there's such an interesting life cycle, right, to objects and materials and how they get to our hands and what kind of things they're engaged with, what kind of politics and policies to extract those materials, um, what kind of um, factories. And, you know, there's, there's so much that goes into um, something before it graces our hands. And um, I was really kind of struggling with this as a maker, right? Because you're making more stuff that you're putting now out mm -hmm. into, into the world. And as a student, you're throwing a lot of that stuff out. You know, as a student, you're just experimenting a lot and you're wanting to try all different kinds of materials and you're producing a lot of waste. And I really felt that kind of conflict of loving to make things with my hand, but also um, feeling this kind of tension with putting more stuff that maybe didn't necessarily need to be there in the world. And so I tried to always figure out a sort of an end goal for, for using a material in a, in, in a project. And sometimes that was quite simple and sometimes it was more complicated. Um, or at least it would turn into another project, almost like a starter culture for a new project. And so I'd made a bunch of um, a series with masking tape and so this was like a all these pieces of masking tape put into one and then sort of sawed in half like a geode so it became the last sort of masking tape piece of all. Um, this is, these are, then I began making um, pieces that could be composted. So these are eggshells that are cut on the lengthwise line, and they're just assembled with using um, like a, their own egg white as a glue. And then if the sculpture broke or if you didn't like it anymore, you just, you know, you could put it in the garden and it would completely compost. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip, skip some stuff. This is my thesis project, which was um, using all different, this um, packaging foam. And then I would, I made a, a huge roll of packaging foam. And I'd had a professor who kept telling me, oh, you always do this. You, you, you work like this. You work in these little gestures, you know, and you make a lot of them, but you always work like this. Like, what happens if you, what happens if you go like this? And so um, this really came out about thinking about that and thinking about this interest in, um, especially in like mollusks that build their own house or that build their own architecture. So I re-rolled re -rolled all this packaging foam until it was a giant sort of haystack rolled size. And then I crawled into it to create a shape. And then that shape stood in the gallery and hold, held a form. Um, and it was sort of like a beautiful organic landscape and object in one. And then after the project was finished, all of that packaging foam was distributed to all of my peers to package their work that they were gonna move home with. And the rest was given to the museum, which they use in their um, kind of daily cycle all the time. So all that material got recycled. So here's a picture of it after it's gone through. Um, I'm going to jump over to bowerbirds, which I'm really excited mm -hmm. and kind of obsessed with. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with bowerbirds, but they're a species that has very little sexual dimorphism between males and females. And so usually, in a lot of bird species, the males will have these fancy plumes, right? And that's how they'll attract the female bird. However, in bowerbirds, um, they almost look exactly the same. And the male birds, they build these amazing structures that are a little courting bachelor pads to lure in the female birds. Um, and so there's many different species of them. They're endemic to um, Australia and also parts of 
um, Papua and Papua New Guinea. And um, there's, there's different formats that these bowers take. Different species collect different things. There's a high degree of um, intentionality in these bowers. And so um, this is a spread from National Geographic. Um, it kind of features uh, a bird with sort of maybe like a, a petal or a berry in its mouth, um, maybe some beetle wings shown up front in this bower. But these bowers are these kind of architecturally sophisticated structures that they then also have these displays of all the things that they've collected. And so some bower birds will collect things that are only blue, some will collect things that are only shiny, some will color coordinate in different piles and sort of sort objects and materials based on their color. And one thing I'm really interested in is how if a bower bird is near a village, it will incorporate all kinds of man-made things into its bower, whereas if it's really in a rural um, part of the forest, it'll purely have, you know, the items that it could find nearby. Um, so sorry, where are you traveling to find these? So um, I did end up travel to, traveling later to Papua, West Papua, to the rainforest okay. to actually see these in person. Um, but before I ever, ever did that, I just sort of watched, I obsessively watched a lot of um, David Attenborough videos about them. And there are some really um, amazing ones. So you get a little, you get a little sense of um, if you go on and you just search for like BBC, mm -hmm. um, there are some really amazing footage of them doing their thing. And he's very fond of fungus. So they've done tests where they've actually like, they've watched one bird sabotage another one's bower, and he'll come back and put things back exactly the same way. Not everything he collects stays where it should. That it was. There's also a lot of housekeeping involved. Uh, because they'll use bugs, they'll use fungus. And he puts alive. these treasures on display within and around a construction that has taken him years to build. And there's, there's, there's a lot of research about why these are the shape that they are. It's thought that they'll amplify the bird's calls. Um, they're also situated to like receive the most a light. A giant bar so, woven around a central sapling carpeted with moss. Beautiful soft layer of moss inside that runs up the sort of central column and away. This grand design is no nest. It's the ultimate seduction parlor. <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you're into the bowerbirds, I highly recommend. There's a lot of videos on them, and they're um, they're extremely fun, um, extremely fun to see. And oh, I don't know what's going on here, but. Um, I did a number of pieces sort of in the same strategy where I would collect materials um, based sort of locally on where I would find them. This is a piece for the Queen's Museum where I used exclusively things from my parents' garage, for example, uh, the house that I grew up in. And so there's old window shades, there's like a sort of shopping trolley cart, um, there's uh, fishing poles and old coffee cans and um, all kinds of different, like a net, all kinds of different things. And some of the forms in here are meant to mimic some of the architecture outside of the museum, which are the World's Fairgrounds, where they have um, a giant globe. A lot of the architecture you may have made, it might have seen like Men in Black. They have these kind of weird futuristic um, towers and different things. And so there's sort of a mimic of um, the outside world and inside world kind of colliding in here. And in this, working in this way, it's really allowed me to collect materials no matter where I go. Um, oftentimes my collections sort of start big and then become kind of curated in. I'll figure out sort of a structure um, that these collections will um, uh, sort of anchor themselves to. So this one includes um, a ton of umbrellas, an old Christmas tree, um, there's crutches and, and oars and different kinds of wood that I've gathered. This was at a space in Vermont that used to be a <coughs> fire station and so there's like an old um, one of those fake fireplaces that, that has like a piece of tinsel kind of rotating around a light bulb and it casts you know kind of this crackly looking um, light and so the, the in this piece it's almost like the piece is on fire at the top of the, the space. Um, there's some details. And I often think that what I'm really interested in is kind of creating these compositions or these drawings in space with objects and trying to, trying to use things that we all have familiar relationships with. There's ladders, there's um, parts of a piano, there's um, uh, tennis rackets, um, there's spools of thread and spears that you use, your know, skewers that you use for barbecuing. Um, but try to kind of create these other contraption like um, uh, installations with them. This is a piece all made out of louders from found in New York City on the street and driftwood from the East Village and scrap wood. So I would go along the East Village with my granny cart and um, mm -hmm. collect wood 
Um, oftentimes my my drawings are really this simple. I'm not um, not really big into sketching. I really work with materials and think through my hands. So oftentimes I'll kind of draw out ideas, but then they um, they come uh, alive in a space. And so it's really wonderful to have curators that sort of trust trust the process and trust you and trust this gallery filling up with lots of stuff that it'll become a project. Um, so sometimes these are the, the ideas, how they look at first, and then you know how I arrive makes, it, makes me seem a little crazy I think sometimes, but this is how they get um, finished when they're put together. Um, I'm really interested in sort of these mimics and echoes between different materials masquerading as one another. So there's a bunch of piano keys in the piece, and then there's also um, these shades that are taken apart, like bamboo shades, and some of them are colored black so that they sort of continue the lines of the black keys, um, and some of them are colored white to continue the lines of the white keys in the piece um, as well. Um, this, these are all those same ladders recycled into a new piece. Um, this time they're kind of flanking a column in a, in a space. Um, this, this is a piece where I incorporated some live plants that have similarly have those staghorn ferns that have those leaves that sort of reach out in a similar direction as these, this kind of energy of reaching out of this um, kind of cartwheel effect. And this piece was called Cartwheel Galaxy. There actually is a Cartwheel Galaxy, mm -hmm. that's what it looks like. Um, within the Cartwheel Galaxy, there is a constellation called the Sculptor's Studio. It was found by a French um, uh, astronomer, and these are some of his drawings of his particular um, constellations that he named. And I was really interested in him because all of his constellations are objects or instruments. Usually they're like animals and myths and but he's like he has beakers he has all these different kinds of scientific equipment and within um, those he also has this sculptor's studio so i'm really interested in how we find our own story wherever we go and how we see things that relate to us in our own story and what we're thinking about wherever we go and i just loved that from that you know kind of that shape that he could get sort of there um and so this is my own um constellation um, called the Sculptor Studio, and there's light bulbs in the same orientation as in the um, asterisms in the constellation. But this time it's really just sort of my modern day Sculptor Studio instead of there being like a bust and some marble. For me, it's all about balancing all this crazy stuff that's going on constantly and trying to make new connections between things that weren't there before. And so this is all recycled um, piping where it's from umbrellas and beach furniture. It's just when I was living in Cape Cod and there would be beach chairs and beach umbrellas like at the dump all the time. <laughs> and so I would rescue those and take them apart and create these new constellations of lines. And this is sort of a, re um, a reference to those, those um, acrobats that spin plates and have all these plates going at more than one time. And I think to be a creative professional, you have to be able to do that um, just to make enough money to live off of and have all these different projects going at the same time and try to have a personal life, you know, like you're always trying to do that. And so um, that really spoke to me in terms of a sculpture studio in a contemporary sense. Um, this is a map where I've embroidered along all of these lines. I've embroidered um, little stars on it and created my own constellations. And this is a piece of textile, like a wax cloth that I found on the beach. And so I laundered it and these lines are just from being out at sea. And I thought it really created this really beautiful map. So this um, piece also comes along with um, kind of a, um, a key with all these different constellations that I made up. In it as well. And these are kind of smaller versions um, of that larger piece that are all made out of trashed umbrellas. So after storms I would go out and collect all the umbrellas that are in the trash and that you see have flipped over and take them apart and they kind of unite all these disparate materials whether they be found or scavenged or handmade all in all in one piece, these kind of constellations. There's another one. There you can kind of see the main stem of the umbrella coming down, a little catch. Um, these are just wishbones collected from eating chicken. Um, this is a smaller kind of constellation of different weird parts all put together, a piece of driftwood from Cape Cod, um, um, some shells found at a, a shell store, <coughs> and um, a photograph. This is a... Um, but, but no sea glass. Oh, and this one? No. This one is actually like a balloon held up, like a, one of those that's deflated in the water and then held up. Um, and then on the other side of the piece, there's the same, uh, a big shell that almost looks exactly as the same as the What happens to these pieces? 
afterwards? Sometimes, very rarely, they're sold. <laughs> so, um, yeah, sometimes they go to other shows, sometimes they go into storage, and then they get shown in other contexts. Um, sometimes they get made into new work, so um, the plywood from this might get cut off and used in a new piece. These are actually just wood clamps from my studio. Um, and this is a branch which became my Christmas tree for that year and then um, went back into the compost pile. Mm -hmm. So um, it really depends. Um, I, when I moved from Cape Cod, I gave away a lot of things on Craigslist and like condensed my parts back down to the original forms like poles and things like that. Um, and there was an amazing recycling center there where people would go and take apart things and reuse things. So they had a kind of like a, a take, a leave take station that would, um, that people also used as artists and as menders. And then they also had a, a complete recycling center in the same facility. So that was a really nice place to leave from because I could take apart things Things and still leave them for other people, throw out some things, keep some things. But as an artist, you know, it's like a, it's a challenging um, experience, honestly. I was talking with graduate students about making all this work and um, also wanting to keep quite um, quite agile and, and quite agile in terms of being able to rise to the occasion and move places and do new projects and things like that without having the money for crazy storage and things like that. Um, and so I've had you know, pieces up for sale, and I've taken them to art fairs, and people have put holds on them, and then the sale hasn't gone through, and then I'd rather save the money to put it into a new project, and so oftentimes I'll just collapse them and get rid of them. And sometimes I'll hold on to certain parts of them, knowing that I can remake the piece again with the same um, formal strategies or, um, yeah, that, uh, that I'll elementally sort of be like, oh, I can get that ladder again, I can get this part again, I can get that part again, but this maybe is harder to find. So it's almost like traveling when you have a library, well, you'll keep all your first editions, but everything else you can, you know, you can get again, um, might not move with you. So it's definitely a challenge. Um, in 2013, after a couple of years of planning, I had gotten, um, I'd gotten a grant in 2010 through the Jerome Foundation that was to go anywhere and do anything that really inspired your practice. And so that's how I got to West Papua. Um, and then they said it was one of their most unusual proposals they had ever gotten. <laughs> um, and uh, it was a really, a really amazing experience. Um, I joined a, um, having a little problems with this. Let's see if it'll let me. I joined a birding expedition in order to do so um, that was mainly biologists, ornithologists, and really hardcore birders. So people that were retired and had a life list of every bird they had ever seen, and this was one of their dream trips. But luckily for me, this area of the world is also um, where the birds of paradise are located. And so um, as part of this trip, was, I was... Um, I believe it was 18 days total. We went to um, island atolls and lowland rainforest and high elevation cloud forest. And we sat in bird hides um, for hours looking for, um, looking for these birds. These are termite mounds. I mean, we saw so many other things while we were while we were there. And this is what one of the bird hides looks for looks like. So you would get there before um, before the break of day, and you would be looking through these um, these crazy holes and st sitting as still as you could. And if you were lucky, you might see a display. Um, so we were very lucky and got to see one of the bower birds at work in terms of tidying up his bower. But one of my favorite things is that I didn't realize they have an amazing. Um, uh, capacity for mimicry and so while we were sitting there you would hear this bird mimic a pig and then a dog and then you'd hear a horse and then you'd hear a motorcycle go by and you'd hear a camera shutter and you'd hear a chainsaw and all the different sounds of the forest that this bird um, had heard it was part of his repertoire and as part of how he attracts um, his mate as well is to have the most sort of strange and kooky and, um, and diverse set of sounds and so um, walking along and um, trying to find these bowers, was a, it was a really amazing thing to sort of stumble upon one of these in the forest. It feels like somebody, uh, it was made by a person, um, but this was definitely made by a bird. Um, they're, they're located on the side and the hillside. You could kind of tell which orientation they would face mm -hmm. in order to get the right um, kind of sunlight. This is one in process, so you can see the moss being put down. They had already found like a really good treasure, so they brought that one <laughs> there, you know, but you could see that um, they, they, take, they use these stems of orchids to thatch the roof and get this really perfect um, arc shape. 
So um, this is a bower that's been deserted, but you could tell that there used to be these kind of displays. And still in the garbage, you can tell they've been sorted according to their color, which I find really amazing as well. And then you'd, you'd find, like with the guides, they would see this and they'd be like, oh, there's a bower bird nearby, or there's a bower that used to be here. There were these kind of clues in the forest of um, why things were. And it was usually um, these colors being matched up that you could tell that there used to be a bower bird nearby. And you know that they also, I think, really reflect the changes in these areas. Um, we were we flew into the capital of West Papua into Sarong, and then flew further into um, into the uh, the inland and in, in, into Manakwari. In Manakwari, probably they were saying this sees about 500 outsiders per year, and so it's a very isolated. Um, region, uh, but that's really changing with, with globalization and, um, and ecotourism and all kinds of different things that are happening there. And so um, one of the, the, the kind of the garbage that's now there that didn't used to be are these sort of single serving water cups. And it's a plastic cup with an aluminum wrapper that have water in them. And you see them everywhere. And now they've um, made their way into the bowers as well. Um, this is some of the local architecture in terms of the island atolls. Um, because of the, and they, this, this is one of the most, um, the places in the world with the most marine biodiversity as well. So luckily while I was there, I learned how to scuba dive and I got to see some of that marine biodiversity. It's called the, the golden coral triangle, this area of the world. Um, and, uh, it just completely blew my mind and I'm still, um, kind of processing that. This is some of the local vernacular architecture, um, where the livestock is held underneath the houses sometimes and it also protects from floods as well. This is just a, um, uh, construction site in Cambodia. And so while I was traveling, I was just collecting images and soaking things up. This is, um, in Bali, which is a Hindu island within a, the Muslim you know, nation of um, Indonesia. And um, I was there during this really amazing um, part of the year. It's kind of like like Halloween. You know, it has that kind of um, spirits from the dead coming home to return. So kind of a day of the dead feel. And they build these penjor, they're called, these um, amazing structures where it's a bamboo pole with a small sapling attached to the top and then offerings that are um, suspended from that sapling, which sort of make the saplings lean over so that you have this beautiful kind of archway. And every house makes their own, so it's almost like the best thing I can kind of compare it to is a Christmas tree in that, you know, everybody makes their own, everybody decorates their own, all the offerings are different, all the kind of decorations are different. Um, and I'm just showing these because I think it will factor in a little bit later when I show a project um, that uh, I spoke of earlier, which I, I worked with Sandra, um, which was at the SUNY Buffalo. And what was really lovely is they invited me to come in and just make a project based on my travels, uh, which was such a great opportunity to kind of digest that. But it was also like six, you know, it was negative 16. It was super cold. It was February in Buffalo, New York. So it was also really challenging of like how to think about the rainforest when you're in snow boots and everything's covered in snow. Um, this gallery was a really amazing space. It had a skylight at the top. Um, and so I immediately knew that I wanted to build something that cast your eye upward. You could also look down from the top floor. They had a little balcony as well. So I wanted something that had all these different views that you could engage with it from. Um, another thing about this gallery was that it, um, in talking to people, people weren't necessarily, people would stop in for openings, but it just seemed like it wasn't really being used on campus in the way that it could. It was such a beautiful, glorious space. And so I wanted to create something where maybe people would spend a little bit more time and read a book there or bring them on a date or um, kind of hang out in this space. So it's almost like a clubhouse feel. It has a hammock underneath. Um, and then these structures kind of rise up from the top. And so you can see them reaching up. So as soon as you go in, your eye kind of goes up towards that skylight and into this other kind of canopy of, of trees that are more sculptures of trees. I was there right after Christmas, and so there's a bunch of scavenged um, Christmas trees in this piece. And then a lot of the other um, parts that are going into the air are kind of composited from um, real wood and scrap wood scavenged from all over campus. And then parts of Christmas trees and parts of um, uh, different uh, different, you know, branches and things I've collected while I was there. So this is the sort of the underside. There you can see somebody hanging in the hammock. Um, it also had these views where you could kind of go up to this, this kind of um, deck level as well. 
Um, and there were also these um, seashells with sound recordings from my travels, which included all the sort of the birds and the insect sounds from Papua. And so much like my trip, I was trying to create a situation where people were kind of rewarded for being curious and could investigate this space almost like it was almost like they were on a hike or something like that. Um, all these different materials were scavenged from the art school. And so this is all the just the debris from like the CNC routers and the um, all the different classes. And I would collect things and layer them on top of each other. So you would get this kind of kaleidoscope of um, images much like foliage from trees when you're looking up into a canopy. And so underneath the piece, you also got this kind of very different viewpoint of looking right up into the skylight than you did from far away. <clears throat> And then at the very tippy top at the balcony level, you could see all sort of like the details of the things composited together. And when somebody was in the hammock, the structure was sound, but it would move ever so slightly from somebody swinging in the hammock. And so you would, these kind of like little feathers and things on top, you would see that little bit of motion and that little quiver. And that was one of my favorite um, things that happened in just the making and trying to see what would, what would happen. So this extends about 38 feet um, up into the air. And we sourced a ladder from an old gymnasium that was on Craigslist that um, could reach that high, which is a really fun part. Um, these are some videos. I'm going to skip ahead. This is um, a public art project that I recently completed for a public elementary school in New York City. It's located near Times Square. Um, it has like a two-story balcony and they were looking for a ceiling mounted sculpture for that space. Um, so I was thinking about things that I was interested in at that time I had just finished this series and I thought about what happened if I blew one of those up really huge um, and suspended it in space. But I wanted a kind of conceptual um, anchor point for that project and so this is the famous nine dots test. And you often give this to children and, or adults and you ask them to connect the dots with as few lines as possible. Um, but, and they can't, they can't um, retrace, you know, they can't take their pen off the, the paper. And many people find it extremely hard to do because the solution for it is to totally go outside of this perceived box. So it's where that expression, thinking outside the box, comes from, is from this, um, this riddle. And so the piece is grounded upon these nine dot tests and instead of having um, dots, each dot is an object. So in case the bicycle makes two dots, there's a fake boulder, there's a cast of a, um, an adult male lion skull, there's a drum a symbol, there's, um, there's a tuba, the bell of a tuba, there's a, um, a basketball, um, and all of the, 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 the qualities, the lines that go through and connect these, um, these objects are the solutions to the test. So this is a model, and then this is the real thing. And so it's just aluminum pipe that creates this kind of, um, those two solutions that are overlaid on top of each other. And there's also little details that figure into the, um, the piece. So um, the piece is almost like a scavenger hunt. If you, there's a, there's a kind of um, handout that teachers can use to talk about different um, things. So find three, of, three things that make sound or that carry sound or find three things that have motion, things like that. Um, and talk about the different connections between objects. And also just wanted to use objects that would relate to kids in 50 years as much as they could to kids today or to, um, to you know, to, to, that were sort of like didn't have a, a very particular time stamp to them. So something like a soccer ball that would read as a soccer ball, either if it was from 1950 or if it was from 2020, you could you could still see it with a soccer ball. Um, and this is where the kids go out to recess. So I also wanted to have that kind of a sense of a visual playground for them. Um, so it incorporates all different kinds of um, sports equipment. And there's also little details of um, little figurines that are hidden with it, within it. And if you're um, upstairs on the second level, you're also eye to eye with many of these objects as well. So um, and you can kind of look down into it. And there's the lion skull, and you can see the playground behind it. Um, and so this is some more recent work. Um, so I was invited to go to residency outside of San Francisco at the Headlands, which is um, right across from the Golden Gate Bridge. And it's this really amazing um, nature preserve where uh, the fog just rolls in and all of a sudden everything is fog. And I had never lived in a place that had that quality. So I was really thinking about that idea of between the, the space between the earth and the sky. Um, in this piece, uh, I just, I didn't bring anything with me. At the time, my father had just passed away and I really didn't want to make work about anything. I just wanted to sit and read and think and write and take walks. And so I did that for 
um, a few weeks and then I all of a sudden started to get an itch to start building something. And so these are all uh, materials that I found in my immediate surroundings. And so um, we lived there, so there were houses to, to kind of pilfer things from or to, to borrow things from. There was also an attic with all kinds of things like broken furniture and things squirreled away. Um, I helped them clean out some storage closets, things like that. Um, and then um, I also went to a local nursery and sourced some plants that were um, local plants as well. Since it was a nature preserve, no, sort of nothing was touched. Um, but then I would go to the thrift store and like find these crazy huge thrift, you know, shells and different things from a different from all over the world. So this also there's um, there's this kind of interesting um, conversation between materials and where they came from and how they ended up there as well. This is all just balanced, just a stack in different ways. There's a National Geographic that sort of features um, the bowerbirds in there. And then there are things, um, this is a, some foam from the ocean that got encrusted in oyster shells. Um, but then there's also things that I encrusted with, um, with rock spray paint or sort of faux out. So there's this relationship between things that are real, like this granite boulder, or things that are fake, like the boulder that I made as well. Uh, and this is another kind of stacking project um, that utilized all these National Geographics and different found parts and I'm kind of playing with this idea of mirroring fake and real objects um, on, on different planes and making these kind of unlikely connections between materials. Uh, this is a project for Sculpture Center in New York where, um, and then I think this will be my last one, this is uh, an amazing old um, building that used to service trolley cars and so in the basement they have these really crazy tunnels and they are inviting site-specific proposals for this space and usually I've seen a lot of artwork in this space and it usually just seems like a sculpture in a tunnel, like it doesn't, and I've always, it's always kind of struck me that it's such a, I mean I feel like this, this space is so sculptural so um, I had proposed to activate this space with a number of different arches that you would walk down through the space. So this is a proposal, and then um, this is an actual piece. So this is myself doing an arch in the body, um, then there's like the arch of a hand of a, um, a shopping bag, there's an arch of this rainbow pinata, there's a, a natural arch photograph, um, there's, a, there's a mannequin that's sort of doing an arch and a back bend, there's a garden arch starts with the sort of arches in your feet and if you stand right behind the arches in your feet you can see straight down this corridor about a hundred feet through the smallest arch and it all kind of lines up um, and so the, you can kind of some of the arches you walk through some of them you walk around and you can kind of keep peeking through each hole to see what's behind it so these are casts of my hands holding postcards with um, famous architectural arches um, there's also things like a slinky and a silly is like half of a donut in there um, at the end of the piece this is um, Walter Benjamin's arcade project, which was this um, posthumously published, which was this amazing um, kind of collage and compendium of all these different um, references and um, uh, this, this compilation about the arcades in Paris. And this was really said to be um, kind of one of the first postmodern works. It was really um, thinking about uh, the commodification of objects and a sort of like this idea of the, the shopping mall and all these things. And so um, again, like a lot of my work, there's many different layers. So I hope that I hope that it's visually exciting enough that kids can sort of run through it and be into it, but that uh, there's also enough, enough layers to, um, to these uh, weird conversations um, between materials, between um, our relationship to things, um, to also so to have them um, have them be a little thicker as well, and so there's just a whole cut through this book so that you can see all the way down to the other end as well. Um, and this is a project that I um, did for uh, for the museum that's up right now. And since the museum was uh, closed for ten months, one of um, my suggestions coming in was that we make an open sign for it. So this is a, a, a nope sign that's like, it, because it's um, fluorescent, it's easier to photograph it at night, but during the day there's an N at the end and that one turns onto open. And so um, we had it at nope for quite a while until the reopening to sort of draw up the curiosity of why is there a nope on that, you know? And then all of a sudden it got to 
it was a really fun moment to, to switch it to open to see what the sign looked like at open. And that's going to be part of their permanent collection as a functional sculpture for inside um, right now. So yeah, right now I've been working with um, a ceramics class and a dance class in the beginning of the semester. And we created a performative installation in the space. Um, and, and now I'm working with my sculpture students and I'm on a mold making project. I'm creating an installation um, that's going to be built over the course of the next month. Um, and it includes all different kinds of materials and it's inspired by a lot of the collections on campus. So I've been volunteering at the greenhouse, looking at their collections of plants. I've also been visiting the Natural History Museum and visiting all their collections. So the, they have an amazing mollusk collection. Um, I've been looking at their collections, their uh, vertebrae collections and the, the birds. I've been looking at this um, media archaeology lab on campus, which has every different model of cell phone and laptop, you know, kind of in a working order. So you, it's a, it's a working lab and so they have old video games and new things and you can kind of try out all these different um, versions of technology and see how um, all that evolved and so I'm visiting all these different collections on campus as a collector myself um, and really thinking about the university as this place where all these different things come together and trying to um, create an installation that speaks speaks to that so it's a good challenge and it's been really fun to just explore the university and kind of mine it in a way for material for this piece so I'm hoping that um, the, the, the piece will, will speak to that, yeah. And um, the exit, Janelle will be working in the gallery while it's open to the public um, for the next month. So yeah. people can actually come, talk to her, and just see the... See it change over time. Yeah. Um, and, and it's been really nice. I've been like sort of crowdsourcing materials from people as I talk to them. So people um, collecting those little stickers that go in fruit right now, and I'm putting them on fake plants, and so they get covered with these stickers that say organic and where the fruit's from. <laughs> so I've been, luckily, been getting all kinds of great submissions people have been bringing me bringing me things and pointing me towards different resources in Boulder and that's been really nice as well I can yeah. take a breath after all this. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I tried to pack it. Well, I know, <laughs> I, I, I thought it was like a download. It's so nice, it's like, it's, it's like a, a, it's like a artistic um, representation of sustainability to me. Oh. I mean, I mean, it's a way to really say, wow, look at all the possibilities of reusing, et cetera. Mm, yeah. Now, you said you're in Bali. Yeah, I was in Bali did, when did, I went. Did when you I went to Southeast Asia. Did you happen to go to Ubud at all? I did go to Ubud, yeah. Did you happen to go to the Green School there? No, I know I didn't go to the Green School, but I met some people from there and got to. I really wish that I had been able to go so I think, to the architecture I think the, and the bamboo. One of the themes and, of that school yeah. is sustainability. Yeah, completely. Yeah, I mean, I really want to go back too. So maybe that'll be a good, a good excuse and, and reason to go back for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it was, um, I, you know, this trip was only 18 days, but to go all the way to West Papua, I thought, okay, I'm going to go all the way there. I, I quit my job at the time and um, put all my stuff in storage. I traveled for about two and a half months over around in Southeast Asia. Um, and it was amazing to come back and have a project to return to, to just kind of process all that I had seen and was thinking about um, through that. So similarly in Boulder, I'm just trying to, this is you know, my first time in, near the Rockies and it's mm -hmm. kind of amazing to think about, you know, these also just in, in so many mystical traditions, there's this idea of, of kind of climbing to the summit of the mountain or this like, you know, and then there's also the gold, the mining, the sense of going inward as well. And so I'm hoping that a lot of the metaphors also of just being in Boulder and thinking about these things will, will lend themselves to, to different um, decisions, you know, and in in what happens with the project as well. Off topic a little bit. Sure. How did you lose your Bronx accent? Oh, I never, I don't know if I ever really had one, you know? Oh, and it's funny because I hear my parents, it's New York accent, my parents have, um, you know, they have accents from the countries they're from, but I think the stronger thing are their New York accents. Like I remember calling home from college and hearing um, like answering machine that their voices on the end. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and I was just like, hi, my mom. Or I talked to my mom, like, hi, my mom. And she's like, oh, I just had some coffee. And I was like, coffee? <laughs> but I think maybe leaving New York, you know, pretty young, like at 18, and then living in other parts of the country, maybe. But, um, not, yeah. But I still, I hear it in my parents more than I do, um, yeah, in my sisters and things. My One of my sisters moved to New Jersey, and I like to... I like to make fun of her <laughs> for her Jersey accent a little bit, but um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you guys for your interest and for coming. It's really fun to share 
Through all this stuff, yeah. So I'm one of four, mm -hmm. and she's one of four oh, sisters. Oh wow! Really? Yeah. So oh, that's fantastic. you're the baby. So I'm the baby. And who Lisa's, do you work with? Lisa's the next old oldest. So so we're only a year apart. Okay. And we got really treated almost like we were the same age or like twins growing up. Like totally. we got dressed the same. We had the same bedtime. Like you know, she was annoyed all the time. She's like, oh, I'm older. But we got kind right. of treated like we were. Um, almost the same age. And then I have two older that I think are, you know, I think there might be a little bit of jealousy about how close we work together. Uh, but we're all really close. We yeah. all get along really, really well. And um, and it's been amazing that my mom has been really interested in working with us. So we're, we're trying to figure out more and more projects that we can kind of so bring her into. And um, I think the secret goal is to do enough of these knit paintings with her that we can just have a show of her knit paintings mm -hmm. um, and just and honor incredible. her yeah. without her kind of knowing, you know, knowing that <laughs> yeah, that would be yeah. the end result. So we're being a little sneaky right now and just trying to like kind of drum up the series um, so that we can have a show of, of her work. But what's nice is too is she's, she's, you know, she's always invented her own patterns and she's uh, more recently started knitting photographs that she's taken as presents for some of her family and things. And I think um, this has also just expanded her ideas about um, what she does in her own knitting, which is really lovely. So, um, yeah, and, and she's, you know, her and my dad were also amazing jury riggers. Like they were really good at fixing things, mm -hmm. not necessarily the way you were supposed to fix things. Mm -hmm. And every time I go home, I look at certain <coughs> things in the house and I think like, that's totally part of my practice. Like just those little, um, you know, using things for not necessarily what they're supposed to be mm -hmm. used for. Um, and that kind of invented inventiveness and efficiency. And I feel like, you know, it does so much in terms of like economic, but it's also so, so much more sustainable to work with what you have and keep fixing things and, um, and find, you know, ways to keep recycling and upcycling. So I like that. Um, I feel like my work, my work, um, I hope, you know, and I'm glad you picked up on that. Cause I think for some people, um, they really see that as a, um, how, it speaks to to that trying way to re envision being in the world with all these, you know, materials and things around us. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm still you know I still struggle with that idea of like how to how do you make more things in the world when you're also just trying to deal with all these all this stuff all around us. But Boulder has an amazing reuse center, so that's been really the resource fun. Center. The resource, yeah. yeah, that's been really fun to go check out, and um, yeah, I've been enjoying kind of poking around. Yeah. So I've been, um, we, we created this space and, um, I feel like there's an assumption that if it's used mm. or borrowed or has already had a lifetime that, um, it has to look junky. It doesn't at all. And it doesn't. And yeah. people walk into our space and they're like, wow, you've put a lot of money into it. And it's like, no, actually, <laughs> um, a do lot you want me to take you, a, and, I'll yeah, take you on a tour and, and say, you know, where house, this came from? Or, no, um, we create, we're, we have an art group, but it's not about us. It's about you <laughs> um, in town. Um, and we just took over a warehouse. Oh, and wow. we created art studios and an exhibition space and awesome. we just got the keys in March 1st. Congratulations. But thank yeah. you. And we've transformed it, but people right away. And so yeah. by taking people through your sculptures, I think that it's really, it's educational mm -hmm. too, because it's like, listen, like, yeah, you're right. That ladder, I have a wobbly ladder and that ladder could be junked, but at the same time, yeah. yeah. <laughs> love it. <laughs> I love the walking ladder. <laughs> Still works. <laughs> but, you know, it's also so many people are new, new, new. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And to show people the beauty within. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm so interested in, um, in the history of objects and how they carry, um, you know, they carry so much information. They carry memory, they carry luck, like, you know, they, they quality. Uh, quality. I mean, so many of the things that were made earlier were meant to last versus a sort of planned obsolescence of things made when, today. When did you get here? Thank you so right. much. Um, in the mid, in mid January. Yeah. So wait till the end of the yeah. semester. Yeah. So, oh, I've oh, heard yeah, that too, wait that it's you insane. Be, like, do you have a car while you're I do have a car. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe you, you, you have a car. car. Yeah. yeah. Like the end of the semester yeah. on the hill. That's what I've heard. That it's just a yeah, that, that period of dumpster diving is out of control. And you don't even, it's, and it's, and, um, <laughs> 
students will just leave things on the street. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is crazy. Yeah, and yeah. it's and I, so I'm actually really excited that you're doing these projects on campus mm -hmm. because I, as Kelly was It'll saying, nice the educational to... quality of those pieces yeah. of maybe if they're just a few minds that when they're moving out looking like, okay, maybe I could turn that into something else, mm -hmm. you know, instead of just yeah. abandoning it on the side of the street, which yeah. happens quite often. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how much, mm -hmm. how much stuff mm -hmm. is in circulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I applaud your use of, um, you know, there's this fine line of art and craft Yeah, and sure. some people you know, have their own opinions, mm -hmm. and um, I so really... Did you say art and craft or art and crap? I mean, crap. <laughs> well, I mean... <laughs> on <where> <laughs> no, a crap. Depends on who you crap. talk to. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. But I think yeah. it's beautiful how mm -hmm. you've taken your mom's um, talent mm -hmm. and have shown it in this greater way. Oh, thanks. Because yeah. that, it's stunning, and yeah. to see an exhibit with just her work know, would be... Me and me and my me and my other sister Lisa are, are so like we're like okay you know it's, what's funny though is that she's so practical about things so she'll be like well I still have that hoodie to hit you know to knit for my grandson and his birthday's coming up so after I'm done with that then maybe we'll talk about it like she's you know she has her own things she wants to do too mm -hmm. um, but yeah the long the long term goal it's definitely to see them all together yeah, in a beautiful. in a space and I think I think um, she hasn't seen she hasn't gone to any of the shows in person yet but. Um, but she's seen them stretched, you know, once they're, once they're hung and um, we've hung them on the walls in the, in her house in Queens to sort of see them done. And um, yeah, I think that they're surprising to her too, in terms of how they hold up. Um, yeah. I was really interested in kind of that, that small part of the presentation that talked about a little bit of her resistance to being mm. called artist or kind of like what that tension is, yeah. uh, which as a word and language person, that's really fascinating to me. Yeah. And I see that happen a lot. I've experienced that with my own mother where she um, is kind of the consummate Southern hostess. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. And my mm. mom is just like, just putting on parties. It's, it's, it's beautiful. And yeah. I, um, and she used to downplay that a lot and not really recognize the art and the craft of that, of creating that space, the centerpieces yeah. she puts together, the place setting she puts out, the way that she mm -hmm. creates a meal, mm -hmm. all those different things. And I actually had a long conversation with her about it one of the last times I was home where I said, do you know this is your art? Because she was yeah. saying that she was having a hard time connecting to me and, mm -hmm. and my poetry and what I do and the yeah. events I put on. And I said, I learned it from you. Like, oh, I've been yeah. Watching it's since, just an extension. Yeah. yeah. And it's and it's a very similar yeah. thing. And it was interesting because at first she couldn't hear it or couldn't see it. Mm. Um, and then when I kind of explained, I was like, no, this is like this. And, and yeah. you know, it's it's the same kind of that urge for creation, I guess, and then that craft. And that kind of practice, but right? Like but your mom yeah. has a practice of hosting. Exactly, and, and it's yeah, so interesting it's, how um, like offering that language for them to understand that part of their life is like, it's kind of a process. Like mm -hmm. at first they don't recognize it, yeah. and then it, but it, it can be an empowering thing, I think. So. I think so too, and I think like oftentimes, especially older communities um, can feel quite alienated from contemporary art, yes. you know, and, mm -hmm. and um, avant-garde music and different things. And, and I think it is uh, in terms of like expanding our language and how we talk about it to be, uh, we're all, you know, in our own way, different makers and, you know, doing different things and have things to contribute and and have a um, uh, you know have a reaction whatever that reaction is we we all find things in whatever we're looking at um, to to you know bring us to new places and see things differently mm -hmm. so